this is super exciting that we can present uh, uh, four great uh, industrial talks. Uh, I start by introducing uh, Luca Vere. Uh, Luca received his uh, uh, <clears throat> Master of Science in uh, at the Politecnico di Milano in the Col Central and an MBA from INSEED. He did research on the Imperial and uh, after uh, uh, working at Schneider Electric, uh, he took the CEO ship of uh, Prophecy which uh, where he's also uh, a co-founder. And uh, um, in, mo in many of the talks today, and uh, there are prophecy chips uh, used, uh, and uh, we were very happy actually to receive uh, recently uh, two of them and work with them. We are very excited to listen to all the newest uh, developments. Luca, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Costas. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm supposed to talk 10 minutes, right? Can I share my screen, actually? Is it okay or? Yeah, you... sure. Okay, perfect. Um, hold on, let me share my screen. Fantastic. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. yes. First of all, I'm... I'm very excited to be part of this uh, of this uh, this conference, and uh, uh, everyone uh, I see a lot of uh, familiar uh, names, and uh, uh, is actually for me is a, is, a, is a first time uh, to join personally CVPR. So uh, and it's a great honor. So uh, at Prophecy, <clears throat> essentially our mission has been since the beginning to bring event-based technology out of the lab to the market. So we are we believe at the tipping point of this uh, technology paradigm shift and make this technology a real uh, economic uh, uh, innovation. So maybe I, I will start with some market uh, considerations and uh, I'm uh, relying on some work that has been done recently by <coughs> YOL Development, which is a market research firm. Uh, so I'm showing some, uh, some uh, recent uh, results that YOL has been uh, publishing actually in a neuromorphic uh, report. Uh, they refer actually to neuromorphic AI or event-based AI. And we are talking about, they are referring actually, they are talking about a $20 billion market opportunity in the next uh, uh, decade, which will penetrate 20% of the global edge AI uh, market opportunity. Here they both consider um, vision and uh, processing, computing. Then if we move to the vision part, which is the area where uh, prophecy is active. So when we consider neuromorphic vision only, then we are talking about an opportunity which is about 30, 40% of, uh, of the global neuromorphic uh, AI opportunity. Um, and which is also, if you put this in perspective of the global CIS market, the global uh, frame-based image sensor market, uh, uh, it has been uh, estimated that uh, the neuromorphic vision technology will penetrate almost 10% of the global uh, image sensor market by 2030. Um, so this estimation has been made by, uh, by YOL, but also actually confirmed by a couple of other um, research, uh, market research analysts uh, recently. And, um, and, yeah, and, and then when you see actually the breakdown of, um, of the segment that they will uh, adopt the technology, you see mobile being actually the main segment with more than 60% of the market share, but actually not the first one. Industrial is, the, is being uh, estimated as uh, the, the first market to adopt the technology, followed by surveillance, IoT, robotics, uh, mobile, and later on also automotive. Um, and as I said, it's not only about you all, many other market research firms and analysts are now acknowledging more and more the fact that uh, event-based technology, neuromorphic technology is becoming uh, uh, a commercial uh, reality. It's not only about uh, uh, research in uh, institutes and universities, academia, etc., but also becoming a real uh, commercial reality. So. Now, transitioning more to uh, what we do at Prophecy uh, and then um, talking more about uh, our application. So at Prophecy, we do two things. On one side, we uh, design, implement uh, event-based sensor uh, to fully unlock this uh, event-based market opportunity. <clears throat> and on the other side, we develop also <coughs> the software. So the software development kit, uh, including a number of uh, uh, <clears throat> 
a computer vision machine learning algorithm that we provide to our customer or, or uh, ecosystem partners to build the entire uh, event-based application. Uh, in addition to the sensor and the software, we actually provide a number of, uh, uh, let's call it uh, development tools, which uh, uh, are, um, for example, evaluation kit, evaluation camera, which some of you are actually uh, uh, purchased, the development kit. So uh, we also provide uh, essentially sensor integrated with embedded platforms such as uh, Xilinx or, um, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, uh, NXP and some others, uh, and also camera module design reference kit, right? So in order actually to really facilitate, it was mentioned actually before, one of the challenges of adopting the technology is really make sure that you can then integrate easily this technology. So we are taking all this burden to uh, also uh, give to the, uh, to the ecosystem, to the market, all the tools that can make the life of whoever is going to adopt this technology uh, as simple uh, as possible. Uh, looking now at more at our sensor lineup, so we have implemented so far four generation of the sensor. So generation three is a VGA. It is in mass production, and this is being currently deployed uh, commercially in industrial automation and machine vision applications. Generation four is actually an HD sensor, and uh, it has been co-developed by Prophecy together with uh, Sony Semiconductor uh, Solutions. And it's today at the test sample stage. It is available through our recent, uh, recently launched evaluation kit V2, version two. And this is actually a great, uh, um, a great step forward for the sensor development because we have been using a very advanced um, technology process that uh, Sony made available, which is a BSI 3D stack process, which is the way to go for this technology clearly, because now we can essentially embed all this intelligence of the event-based sensor in the CMOS layer and then uh, stacking it uh, underneath the photodiode, which of course lead to uh, a much smaller pixel pitch. So from generation three, we moved from 15 micron, pix uh, micron uh, pixel pitch down to 4.86. So almost uh, 10, 10 times uh, uh, reduction of silicon surface, plus all the benefit of a very optimized process um, uh, fill factor exceeding 80%, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we, we think that now with Gen4, we are really, uh, we have the state of the art of event-based uh, sensor. And this collaboration with Sony has been announced actually last year at ISCCC. Um, Gen4 is not only the smallest pixel pitch event sensor, it's also the one with the highest HDR. Um, and this, uh, to me, um, really the result of a very strong and successful collaboration between uh, between Prophecy and, and Sony. So we are very glad of uh, this collaboration with, uh, with uh, actually the market leader, of course, of, uh, of the conventional uh, image sensor with almost 50% or even more uh, of the market share in conventional image sensors. So they, 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 are, they, they were very, very helpful in, in working with us and, and bring event-based te technology to this uh, uh, stage of, uh, of development. Now, um, we want also, uh, so the sensor is one part of the story, as I said, the other part of the story is about the software. Uh, so we actually started releasing our MetaVision software development kit end of last year. Since then, actually, we have been uh, um, uh, releasing, um, uh, sending, uh, updating with a few releases. And uh, uh, today, MetaVision uh, contains a, a number of uh, 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 um, tools and algorithms. So more than uh, 90, 95 libraries, to be more specific, of computer vision and machine learning, 67 code samples, 11 ready to use applications, mostly for now in the IoT and the industrial automation space. I will come back to this later. Um, all these uh, code samples application libraries are part of six module families, which are machine learning, analytics, calibration, 3D, computer vision, plus other core functionalities. Uh, plus we have also released uh, recently an open EB, so an open source architecture, because we want to enable as much as possible uh, the community uh, of user to uh, adopt the technology. We have uh, in the last, since we released actually OpenEB, which was two months ago, we have by now uh, more than 250 active users working on, uh, on, on OpenEB. So that's, that's actually great. It shows clearly the interest. And uh, many, many, uh, many uh, examples, many uh, of, of usages of, uh, of, of MetaVision SDK, so clearly um, and a lot of, the, of this actually in, in real life uh, application with customer. 
And by now, more than 1,000 uh, companies actually uh, uh, downloading MetaVision for intelligence from our website since uh, the launch in October last year. So I'm showing this number because I want to give a sense of uh, how strong is the traction around uh, the um, industrial interest for uh, event-based technology. So all these are uh, companies, public, private companies that are currently working with uh, MetaVision intelligence, experimenting, inventing, some actually deploying uh, uh, commercially uh, this, uh, uh, this technology. So the ecosystem is growing and that's exciting because of course, uh, when you come with a disruptive technology, when it comes, what, it, what is, uh, comes together with uh, the, the word disrupting is that you start disrupting also the value chain. So you need also to make sure that uh, um, the, the established players in the value chain, they find their, their own position. So today we are glad that companies like, for example, Sony, Intel, Bosch, Renault, Nissan, for example, they, uh, they are working with us, they work with our technology to actually uh, cover some of the gaps of the value chain. Because you, we come with a sensor, we come with a software, but you need to put together a camera module, a camera system, an entire solution, a distribution channel in order to really to, to make sure that from the development to the customer, you have a full, uh, a complete a, a complete end-to-end -end, uh, end -end offer. And for example, uh, for our generation three, we have we have in, we have collaborated with two companies, one in Japan, Century Arts, one in Germany, Imago. They have both developed industrial automation cameras. So these are currently deployed in uh, in uh, in uh, industrial machineries or uh, industrial processes uh, for a machine vision type of application. So these are applications that are related to quality control and inspection typically right so this is uh, the world of typically high speed machine vision in real time for some quality control process i will i will show you some examples in a second and we are preparing as i said the next generation of the sensor so we have recently launched our evkv2 which is running the hd test sample which was co-developed with sony now going to uh, for me the most interesting part of this uh, of this uh, uh, summary I'm giving to you. So I would like to walk you through a few applications. Um, some actually are public. We have recently uh, disclosed our uh, collaboration with uh, key partners. Some other are still undisclosed. So hopefully we will be able to disclose soon. So recently we have announced a collaboration with Xperi um, for actually the world first in-cabin monitoring system. Uh, so this is uh, typically used for um, autonomous driving or driving assistance, assistance applications. So you have a camera uh, observing the status of the driver for safety related, uh, of course, uh, uh, issues. And uh, we are running here an event-based sensor, uh, the generation four, the HD sensor. So in this video, we are showing we can perform face detection and tracking, gaze tracking, head pose estimation, plus some other driver monitoring uh, features like eye blinking rate, eye blinking duration, which are typically used for drowsiness detection and attention monitoring. This video actually has two sequences. I don't know if you observed, but in the first part, actually, the person is running the, the demo at 100 lux, so typically in a, an indoor environment. Uh, uh, and then in the second session, actually, switch on off the lights, showing with a luxometer that we are at below almost uh, below 100 millilax. And we are not using any infrared projector here, just to show that the, actually the technology performs very well in extremely low light and still performing uh, nicely for, for, for example, uh, gaze tracking, eye blinking, etc. So this is one first uh, successful implementation, uh, which we are currently pushing to, uh, to, to the marketplace, to the tier one, so YAMS also uh, last miles delivery robots. Um, and then one other partnership we are announced, are announced recently, still in the automotive space, it was Terranet, it's a Swedish public company. They have actually implemented the, the first event-based uh, uh, LiDAR for automotive. Uh, they're using actually three cameras, three event-based camera combined with a laser scanner. And what they do is that they do some triangulation to following uh, basically the, the, the tip of the laser beam. And uh, from that, they can actually produce a very fast uh, a millisecond latency level uh, 3D voxel flow for, uh, of course, uh, uh, driving assistance or autonomous driving uh, features. Another uh, recent announcement we have done is with uh, Cambridge Consultant, UK-based company, so it is in the medical field. So Cambridge Consultant has used our technology for essentially uh, produce uh, the next generation of cell 
therapy diagnostic tool for real-time sterility testing. As you can see in the video, we can detect um, uh, uh, the cells in, in, uh, uh, in uh, observed by the camera. And uh, typically, this is a process that is quite manual. It, take, it takes sometimes, I mean, one or two weeks, so which is uh, uh, quite lengthy and also uh, uh, dangerous in some life critical situation. So we have shown that using an event-based sensor can actually shorten this, uh, this time for, uh, for the, the, the sterility testing system from weeks actually down to a, a millisecond. So you can also, you can almost perform real time, uh, real time diagnostics uh, uh, with, with an event-based sensor. So that's, that's currently being deployed with some medical device companies. Um, and uh, also very recently, a few days ago, we announced our collaboration with Gensight. We are still in the medical field. So Gensight has used our technology for visual restoration of blind using optogenetic therapy. So they're using our sensor. Our sensor is connected to projector, projector, project light in retina of people who have a late stage of retinitis pigmentosa who are uh, becoming completely blind and they're able to restore partially their vision capabilities using uh, the event-based sensor as, uh, uh, as an input. So that's actually very, also very, very valuable uh, implementation of the technology. And now moving to more uh, other recent application, but we, which we cannot disclose yet our partnership. Uh, we are working actively on live deblurring. Uh, blur is an issue with conventional frame-based technology because as when the target moves during the exposure time, typically it generates some blur. Event-based sensors don't have this problem due to the fact that they have this uh, synchronous per pixel exposure. So we don't, we don't typically don't have motion blur. So we can actually, by combining side by side an event-based sensor, frame-based sensor, we can use event-based data fusing with the frame stream and correct the motion blur. So the result is what you see in this video. On the left side is the raw video of a frame-based sensor. We are using this exactly what you see on the left and, and fusing with the event data uh, of a camera, which is again uh, uh, in a ca dual camera module uh, synchronized and calibrated together with uh, the frame-based sensor in order to correct the motion blur. As you can see actually in, the, in, the, in some of the frames in the end uh, here, for example, so you typically have some motion blur on the facade of the building on the right side, while on, 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 the, right, on the left side, sorry, on the right side, you don't have this issue. So the, the image is, is much crisper, is much more, is much better. So these are implementations which are very relevant. We, we really, until two years ago, we ne never thought about this type of implementation of event based technology we were, we, because we were very much focusing on sensing type of application. We, we didn't think about uh, imaging, but this actually turns out to be extremely interesting for surveillance, IoT, some mobile application, action cam, et cetera. And then some other uh, implementation, which are more in the industrial automation world. So vibration measurement is one of these. So this is actually very interesting because each single pixel becomes a vibration measurement point. Um, so we can measure vibration frequency and amplitude. And this is actually extremely relevant for a predictive maintenance because the changes in vibration is a typical indication of a failure mode. So this can be done in real time. It's the first actual implementation of a real time uh, tool for uh, um, predictive maintenance using vibrations. And then particle size monitoring. This is relevant in, in an application of uh, pharmaceutical in, and, and, uh, and uh, food and beverage. We are able to count more than 500,000 pixels per second at 99% precision with very nice actually performance of, of tracking because we, have, we are more robust against occlusion due to the natural motion segmentation of the scene. Um, so that's actually very, very nice, for example, for also for some jet monitoring application, semiconductor industry. So we have a couple of customers now uh, designing our technology in their machines, and uh, they will actually go to market next year. Spatter monitoring, we are in the world of metal working machine tools, um, for example, for metal working using lasers. Uh, what is uh, relevant here is that event-based sensor can det detect and track uh, high-speed uh, spatters which are generated by the laser when they, they do welding process on, on metal, for example. And this can uh, be used, this information of, uh, of the spatter pattern can be used to actually do some uh, real-time uh, quality control on the laser welding. So this is actually quite unique as an application because you need both speed, a very wide dynamic range, uh, uh, etc. And uh, just one more is on, on in the smart access control. Uh, here we benefit from the fact of having uh, low data rate and sparse information to reduce computational cost and power of the system. So we are now, our customer in Japan is now embedding 
uh, our uh, our actually um, uh, detection tracking uh, uh, pipeline into an embedded platform uh, to be delivered to the to the market uh, before end of the year. So yeah, so until now it has been a fantastic journey with Prophecy, and we will keep growing and pushing and uh, and making sure this uh, this uh, event based technology will become a reality. Because the two things, I strongly believe that uh, a technology and the, and and uh, and the technology. Uh, invention can actually become a real innovation when when it's combined by fantastic research as the one you have been showing so far together with actually industry that is uh, is funding this research is finding actually clear customer opportunity because it is the way you can you can generate this virtual circle of uh, of uh, uh, research and uh, uh, commercial exploitation so today uh, prophecy is a group of about 100 engineers or, or more we are based in Paris. We have now presence actually in the US, in China, uh, in, in Silicon Valley, in Japan. And um, yeah, we see this, uh, we have been assisting to a very growing ecosystem of partners that are, are now adopting the technology. And that's, that's glad, I'm glad to do that. And um, yeah, so um, I think with that I'm done. So thank you for your attention. So if you have questions, I'm here with David and, and happy to take any question you, you, you may have. I think we're going to uh, take all the questions at the end, at the like end. we did with all the previous <laughs> sessions. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. So next, uh, <clears throat> uh, we have uh, a talk uh, by Oliver. Let me make sure that uh, this is Oliver next. Uh, yes, indeed. The next one is Oliver. Yes, great. OK. Uh, but I'm not so sure that he's around. Oliver, are you there? Perhaps we can move on with uh, social. And then if Oliver comes back, uh, we can switch swap places uh all right uh, let me hold on let me introduce you first uh, susan uh so susan uh, uh, uh chen is the founder of uh uh, uh seller pixel uh and uh, uh, uh one of the uh, main uh producers of uh, uh even based uh, uh cameras uh, he uh, held a postdoc research fellowship at uh, HK uh, UST. Uh, he was a postdoc at uh, Yale, and in uh, July 2009, he joined the Nanyang Technological University uh, as a faculty. Uh, Celepixel Technology is uh, now part of uh, Wheel uh, Semiconductor, and he will talk about the most recent development of event-based sensors and associated applications. Susan, please go ahead. Hi, hi. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, it's uh, it's like a three a.m. in my side. I <laughs> a little bit sleepy, but let me try to uh, talk as clear as possible. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that uh, we have been part of uh, Wheel Semiconductor uh, since May 2020. Uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, talk about the recent progress uh, in event sensor and also algorithms. Uh, this table shows our uh, new sensor. Uh, basically, in 2018, we developed a, a 1 million uh, sensor uh, with the uh, 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 using front side uh, FSI process. Uh, each pixel is 9.8 by 9.8. And then this year, we are going to launch a new one uh, with 2 million pixels. Uh, so you may wonder why, uh, how come? Uh, it's mainly driven by some customers. They really wanted to have <clears throat> a higher resolution. Uh, so this one is mainly designed for uh, application like in smart home. Uh, surveillance. 
uh, it's used a uh, uh, 3D process, um, seed farm nanometer. Uh, each pixel is 5.6 by 5.6. Uh, the rate of speed is faster, uh, so we can guarantee uh, 200 mega events per second. Uh, but of course, we know that there are some uh, several cases. Uh, for example, there could be uh, a case that uh, the whole root pixels the fire together. In this in this uh, kind of scenario, uh, we use some uh, encoding techniques. We can uh, group them uh, using a very uh, compact. Uh, 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 in the amount of data and to represent the whole row. Uh, in this case, uh, using the same amount of uh, bandwidth, uh, we can achieve uh, equivalent uh, of like one giga event per second uh, of uh, readout bandwidth. Uh, also, uh, you know, in the previous workshop, <clears throat> uh, I have been introducing uh, a, a time step method. We call it in pixel time step. I'm going to mention uh, this uh, again uh, in the following uh, uh, slides. Uh, but in this sensor, I mean, in this two million sensor, uh, it's because the application is mainly for a uh, smart home. So we don't need a very high uh, accuracy of temporal resolution. So that's why we only uh, build off pixel time step. Uh, but in this sensor, we build some new features. Uh, for example, we have. Uh, uh, event read controller. Uh, so basically, we can real time detect the uh, event read and then use this uh, to control uh, power manager. And then we change the clock speed uh, to achieve uh, low power consumption. Uh, this, this is the, the architecture of the new sensor. Uh, I mainly want you to highlight that uh, uh, since our previous generation, uh, we have been offering a MIPI interface. Uh, the main purpose is to uh, connect the sensor directly to some mobile processors. So we know that in order to reduce the cost and then uh, make the system uh, smaller, uh, we uh, don't use the FPG. So in order to remove FPG, so we must connect the sensor directly to the processor. Uh, so the only way to do that is using a standard interface. So that is MIPI. Uh, but MIPI uh, has been traditionally designed for <clears throat> frame-based sensor. So basically we have to do some changes. Uh, the way to do that, we have to pack uh, the events into some single frames. So in order to let the MIPI to recognize it and then process uh, to send it to the receiver. But this means uh, this also means that at the receiver side, you have to decode the data. So this will give uh, a little bit of kind of overhead uh, in processing, but that's uh, not, not much uh, uh, I mean, the good news is that, that um, uh, it's not much competition. Okay. Uh, this is the general architecture of our uh, pixel. Uh, we introduced uh, uh, it's uh, detailed in previous workshop. Here, just to make a, a quick recap. Uh, it includes, uh, you know, the log photo detector. Uh, then after that, uh, after this uh, uh, called uh, uh, amplifier filter, the uh, changes uh, will be compared to uh, two comparators. So either one of them is, is, is flipped, then there is the event uh, generated. The event will be memorized by an in pixel memory, uh, basically it's like a latch. So here we have event, but at the same time, so we have another branch uh, so the event will be used to uh, control a uh, sample on hold uh, uh, a switch. So we can uh, sample hold two type of signals. Uh, one signal is directly from the log photo detector. So this means that when you read the event, and uh, you not only have uh, the, the event position, the time step, but also can have its log intensity. So we believe that this will be uh, useful for uh, uh, signal processing. Uh, so, because the polarity uh, is not enough to dis to fully describe the property of the pixel at this moment, but if you have its uh, direct intensity, so basically you don't have to guess, you know, its uh, intensity at the moment. And the second information we can stumble through is the uh, we call it in pixel time step. Uh, here, I would like to highlight. Uh, so, uh, in the past uh, two years. 
we found that uh, some applications require very high accuracy of time step. So this can only be done uh, using this uh, impact time, uh, time step techniques. Uh, so let me uh, uh, talk about this in detail. So uh, <clears throat> we know that uh, many times we think the unit sensor is idle. It's something like this. So whenever you, uh, you know, the changes is larger than some threshold, the event is generated. And we also think that it will be processed immediately. But in fact, uh, it's not really true. Okay. Uh, the, the problem is that the, the, the real sensor, many times, for example, if I, might, I put my hand close to the uh, camera, so if you move your hand, you will generate a lot of events at the same time. So this will, the number of events will congest the readout uh, bandwidth. So it means that it will generate uh, uh, latency. So the latency not only generated by the readout, but also uh, you know, uh, is uh, in fact in the, related to the log footage detector. So the real sensor model is something like this. Whenever you have an event, uh, in, or whenever <coughs> the, uh, the light uh, changes reaches to some threshold, an event is generated, but that doesn't mean that it will process at the same time. So it will be processed to the later. later. Uh, the interval between the two basically is the delay. Uh, and after that, the pixel got selected, uh, but then we know that uh, there is another delay, it's called the refractory time. So, uh, so, so there are two types of delay, right? One is due to readout, you have many pixels there. Another one is refractory delay. So usually the second part, the refractory delay, we know that is programmable. So, is almost the same across all the pixels, but the read of the delay is random. Uh, you know, in the previous uh, <clears throat> a few talks, talk about the arbitrage. So in fact, the uh, arbitrage uh, is one uh, problem. Uh, okay. Uh, so the real model is something like this, uh, I have mentioned. Let me use a metaphor to uh, talk about this again. So if you assume that you have two objects, uh, one is the blue hand and now another one is the is, uh, is the red hand. Okay, the red hand happens, you know, sometime after the blue one. So if you assume that the two motions happens, uh, you know, there are enough time gap between the two, uh, using whatever kind of time step method, so we can uh, distinguish them. Uh, we finish reading the blue one then you read the red one. But if the, the two motions are happening too close in time, then it's possible that the, the events will basically mixed, uh, mixed together. Then uh, you don't know who read out first, who should read out later. Okay, usually we know that the off pixel time step is designed when you read, when you select the, the, the events, okay. Uh, but uh, previously we mentioned the in pixel time step. The in pixel time step is basically when the events are generated, we assign its time step. Then later we read it out, but this will be, you know, regardless, it's a readout sequence. Uh, we can trace it back. Okay. So um, uh, the problem is that we know that uh, uh, either you use arbiter or use the uh, uh, you know, here uh, I also mentioned in the previous uh, talk that uh, from our fourth generation sensor, we begin to replace the arbitrage using scanners. So anyway, you will be selecting some rules when some motion happens. For example, when the red motion happens, uh, the scanner is at this rule, oh, sorry, is at this rule, at the 40th rule, then you have more new motion happen. So the next rule you selected will be 50. Okay, so you're going to read out uh, the 51, 52, 53, and 56 together. So the red motion and the blue motion, basically the pixel read up together. So next, you're going to continue to read to finish the blue ones. After finish this, basically the scanner will go back and it will begin to process the uh, 20 rules. So therefore you can look at 
there are some pixels. Uh, so the these three pixels. So they basically experience a very high delay. So you think about the arbitrage. So arbitrage can have some random sequence. You know, uh, uh, either you use you know the the earlier version, the greedy arbitrage. The greedy arbitrage, there are possibility that it will be stuck at some branches. So after we finish all of the events, then we will jump to another branch. So for sure it will have problem. But even you use so for so-called fair arbitrage, but the run the rate of sequence is random. You cannot guarantee that uh, these three pixels uh, will have some kind of set amount of uh, delay. So because it's random, you can you don't know basically how much is it. So it's possible that the delay can be some millisecond or even longer. Okay. So so therefore uh, we basically rely the problem. We have replaced it by uh, sequential scanners. So uh, the worst case delay will be the time you finish the whole round of scanning. This is the, the worst case delay. So if you make the readout fast enough, you can guarantee that the, the latency is less than some millisecond. Okay. Um, of course, there are some other ways to make it even faster. Uh, but anyway, this is the, the best uh, accuracy we can achieve using off pixel time step. Uh, we know that uh, so far, we think the event sensor has a time resolution of some microsecond. Uh, but to me, I think this doesn't make sense. If you have a jitter of millisecond, then what's the what's basically what's the meaning to have one microsecond resolution? Okay. Uh, so therefore, for some application, if you really need very high accuracy, for example, some tenth of microsecond uh, accuracy, you have to use in pixel time step. Okay. Uh, also, uh, in terms of algorithms, uh, we have some uh, progress. Uh, we developed a fully uh, uh, event driven uh, kind of uh, HCI system, including the, the, the initializer, tracker, and also classifier. Uh, the me, I don't want to go to too much detail. Uh, the main idea is that uh, uh, we have uh, 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 this, uh, this kernel. Uh, it extracts information uh, from the temporal local resolution uh, regions instead of uh, uh, you know treating everything like a 3D geometry, uh, you know uh, extract from its geometric uh, local regions. Uh, this is the the main idea of uh, the uh, tracker, also initializer. Uh, we use event density to identify where the uh, hand is, because the system we developed are mainly related to, uh, uh, you know, this uh, like hand gesture recognition, uh, using hand to control uh, or play games. Uh, okay, we also integrate into a QB system. Uh, finally, we also developed a, a kind of attention assistance system. Uh, it can also be used, uh, uh, you know, in the travel monitor system. So basically uh, evaluate uh, how many times the uh, the public. Uh, uh, here we use one CIS, also event sensor. Uh, the main benefit is that uh, we achieve very low power uh, consumption because the CIS uh, we only need it to run uh, at like five FPS. Okay, so the main work is done by uh, event sensor. Then we use the uh, uh, CIS as like auxiliary, auxiliary kind of assistance. Okay, that's all my talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Susun. Uh, we are going to keep uh, all uh, the questions for the end. Please uh, feel free and I even encourage you to post uh, questions on the chat box. Sure, sure. Uh, and uh, if you don't want to forget them, uh, Oliver in the meantime has uh, uh, joined and uh, <coughs> So Oliver is associate professor uh, in uh, CS and uh, ECE at uh, Northwestern uh, University. He is the director of the Computational Photography uh, Laboratory. 
uh, he has uh, funding uh, from a lot of uh, like industrial uh, uh, sponsorships. He has uh, worked uh, in uh, many other like uh, fields uh, in uh, optics and vision, including 3D nanotomography. Uh, and uh, uh, he will uh, talk uh, uh, today about uh, both uh, hardware and uh, algorithm uh, co-design with uh, event sensors. Uh, Oliver, Oliver, please go ahead. Great. Thank you, Kostas. OK, so um, um, I have more slides than I than I can go through, so I'm going to kind of blast through this. Um, main thing here I want to get across is that the, the work here uh, primarily comes from uh, Nathan Matsuda, who was my PhD student, um, is now at Facebook Research Labs, uh, Winston Wang, who um, just graduated last year and is now at Apple, and then uh, Henry Trapp and Shrutarshi Banerjee, who are uh, PhD students at Northwestern right now. Okay, so um, so I work in computational imaging. Um, a big uh, key component to this is this idea that you can make your uh, your illumination and your uh, camera optics programmable, and then you can use that to design a forward operator that tells you how the important parts of your scene uh, X map to uh, 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 intensities that you measure at each pixel Y. And, um, and the key here is thinking about the whole system from end to end. Uh, so you're considering not just how uh, the scene information that you're interested about encoding optically via illumination and sensor optics get mapped to uh, uh, digital numbers that get read out by your sensor, but also what is the algorithm that's going to use to process uh, those uh, measurements that you make. And so this is the end, and this is the hard, this is the, the high-level concept of hardware software co-design, and um, we have applied it all over the place from everything from uh, uh, problems at the nanoscopic scale. So Kostas mentioned this, these problems of nanotomography, but also at the microscopic scale, working on computational microscopy, as well as things at the larger scale, including um, some of the event sensing work that I'll talk about today, as well as things that are even larger at uh, remote sensing and astronomical scale. Here's just one quick example. This is an example of looking around the corner where we use a very special source of laser, uh, use it to uh, image uh, light that goes through a scattering medium. The, the actual measurements that you get made uh, look like total garbage, but when you perform the appropriate computational algorithm that is aware of the type of illumination that you used, you can actually reconstruct uh, scene data in a latent way from what otherwise would look like total garbage. So this is a very sort of canonical example of hardware software co-design. We picked a very special type of illumination to work with the type of sensor that we have, such that with the appropriate uh, algorithm, we can reconstruct the information that we care about. So, um, and this is a slide from uh, Emma Alexander, which I think really brings home why this is relevant to the event sensing community. And, and so a key idea behind uh, computational imaging is this idea that we're not going to just treat each of these components independently. We're not going to consider the optics and the computation and the scene information to be uh, completely independent. We're going to try to link them together. And um, you know, one of the great things that um, Emma talks about is this idea that this is something that happens in nature all the time, uh, that intrinsically uh, vision systems that occur biologically are linked to the type of computation that that biological system has, and that this is, uh, at the end of the day, linked to some sort of biological imperatives like getting food or finding mates. So this is not a new concept. This is an important concept in nature, and this is partly why uh, we are interested in event sensing, because we see it as a biologically inspired sensing mechanism that we want to incorporate into this computational imaging paradigm. And um, I'll just talk really briefly. I have no idea where I am in time, so I'm just going to keep going and just shut me off as soon as um, I've gone over. Um, I, there's two things that I wanted to talk about. One is uh, 3D sensing, 3D cameras, and the other is high-speed uh, video sensing. And the first thing I'll talk about is this idea of uh, 3D sensing. And so there's many different types of 3D sensing. I'm not talking about time of flight techniques here. I'm talking about triangulation-based techniques, specifically about structured light techniques. And um, and so this is this idea of uh, motion contrast 3D. And the idea is, uh, is pretty darn simple. It's really just that you have this, um, sorry, um, you have this uh, um, laser projector that's projecting a point in the scene that's moving across your scene that is getting imaged onto a motion contrast camera that is seeing the one point in the scene that that laser projector uh, is reflecting off of. 
That is scanned really fast um, and you get a set of readout um, from your event sensor that tells you which pixel fired at which location. You use that to tell you um, uh, information about the disparity in the scene that you couple together with your laser projector timing. And from that and from a calibration uh, system, you can uh, extract 3D information at very, very high speeds. And so this is the key here is that uh, for the MC3D system, we can scan across all of the pixels in our volume in the same amount of time that it takes to scan only a single point or a scan line of points uh, from one frame from a conventional frame-based camera. And so as a result, we can re essentially reconstruct all the 3D information using this triangulation principle in just a single, uh, the same amount of time it would take to capture a single frame from a conventional frame-based camera. But the real advantage actually comes from something else, which is this light rejection capability and the differential sensing aspect of event sensors and motion contrast sensors. So this is an example, which is actually a structured light 3D uh, um, scanning system where there's a laser here that's projecting light onto this light bulb. And when the laser projects light, we just get a very small change in the irradiance at that single point on the light bulb, which is then detected uh, by the event sensor because there's a change in brightness there. And miraculously, this event system is not uh, being uh, completely confounded by the constant brightness, the biased brightness of the light source. And it's able to just detect the uh, change in brightness due to the light source of the laser scanning across the surface. And here you can see a 3D scan of this light bulb being performed in real time. And so what this means is that you can do uh, 3D scanning outdoors in very bright light conditions. Here's an example as bright as we can get. Nathan is outdoors using his 3D scanning system and comparing it side by side with a time of flight Connect based, um, uh, Connect 2 based uh, 3D sensor. And we see we get pretty good 3D results, actually a little bit better than the Connect, uh, a better uh, light rejection, ambient light rejection than the Connect 2 sensor. Okay. So that was 3D sensing, just really quick about our high-speed video work. Um, so the idea here is that we have a lot of background doing um, uh, uh, compressed sensing video. So we've built uh, systems to capture spatiotemporal compressed video. We've also built uh, 3D microscopy systems to try to capture 3D information of biological samples in real time. And all of this got us interested in using event sensors to be able to record higher speed video. And so one of the things that we played around with early on was this fusion problem where suppose that we have low frame rate, uh, frame based intensity video, and then we also have events. Can we figure out um, uh, 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 good algorithms for trying to recover video from that um, at higher speed than the intensity frame rate at speeds closer to what you can get with the event sensor? And um, I'm going to skip over the results there, but I'll sh uh, show some uh, results that build off of this, which was this, the same idea of trying to do fusion between intensity and events using this uh, uh, guided event filtering, which was um, one of the um, uh, core PhD contributions from Winston Wang, who again graduated recently and is now at Apple. And the idea here is to try to uh, perform motion compensation and um, extract gradients from intensity images and use those to be to guide the type of filtering that you perform on event frames that are generated from, from event cubes, event volumes. And so the first concept is this idea that if you have um, a, a texture in the scene that's moving at constant velocity, it produces event volumes that are uh, where the intensity of information is sheared. And so you have to have some notion of uh, projecting the event volume before you uh, compress it to an event frame and um, you can use uh, essentially motion contrast um, uh, motion compensation techniques to try to find which projection uh, will produce the best motion compensation and maximize the contrast in the event volume that's the first concept so first you take a normal event frame and you uh, don't process it the normal way you try to uh, use contrast maximization to get a better compression that compensates for the motion and then the idea is that you take uh, intensity uh, gradients from an intensity frame and use those to propagate in a guided sense to produce better uh, uh, filtered event frame output than you would have gotten otherwise. And, and, the, and it works really well. So here's the event frames that you get out of what would otherwise be uh, event frame being processed at low resolution. So you get higher resolution, higher fidelity, better edges, better uh, fidelity to the uh, intensity gradients that you are capturing at the same time. And it's useful for all sorts of things. So here's an example of an event uh, tracking algorithm that completely fails when you're looking at native event output, whereas if you're using guided event filtering, you could produce much more robust uh, tracking from the event frames that are produced using this technique. 
Okay, I wanted to talk about this a little bit. I didn't have a chance to talk about it in my um, slides. I just really, really briefly, um, um, here is a architecture where we have come up with, where we're trying to solve this rate distortion problem. We assume we have a chip that can capture both intensity information and events. And we're interested in understanding uh, how much information should be sent via raw intensity and how much information should be sent via raw um, events. And um, there's a lot inside of this. Um, uh, you can look back to my slides if you're interested in this topic. We have a, a series of publications on this. One of the core components is an edge reconstruction algorithm that takes in events and a distorted intensity frame and uses it to enhance, to produce an enhanced frame. Here's some examples of a distorted frame. So this is highly pixelated, so highly compressed. Here are the events that are sent. We already have, we also have mechanisms for producing event compression. And the idea is that these two things together uh, produce something that uh, has much higher fidelity uh, intensity output and can be fed through a um, object detection or tracking algorithm on a host chip that has limited bandwidth with a sensor. And these are the kind of interesting things that you can do with this is you can look at these trade-offs between the ratio of amount of uh, bits that you're using to assign to your events versus the amount of information that you're uh, assigning to uh, the intensity information and find out where you get a peak performance with respect to a specific track. So this is an example of tracking uh, um, a car in the need for speed data set. Okay, so with that, um, I'll just say that the latest thing that we're looking interested in looking in is SNNs and is specifically looking at hybrid uh, analog and spiking based neural networks. And we have some interesting results in that that was just uh, published at ISIP. And, um, and with that, I'm sure I've gone way over, but thank you uh, for humoring me and um, letting me do that. <laughs> no, that was actually very good in time, 10 minutes. Oh, it was? Uh, okay. So, I mean... <laughs> so uh, we will uh, uh, proceed with the last talk. All the questions uh, uh, will be uh, at the end. Uh, and uh, the last talk uh, is by Sony AVG. Uh, the speaker uh, is uh, uh, Christian Brindley. Uh, and uh, uh, sorry, I'm navigating across uh, too many windows here. So Christian uh, did his PhD at uh, uh, ETH uh, with uh, uh, Toby. Uh, and uh, after he graduated, he co-founded uh, the startup uh, Insightness. Uh, Insightness uh, uh, was uh, uh, acquired by Sony in 2019. And now Christian is the CEO of uh, Sony Advanced Visual Sensing. Uh, Christian, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. And um, thank you also for the um, possibility to present here at the um, homecoming day of uh, event-based vision sensing. So it's really nice to see kind of um, all of the faces again. I mean, unfortunately, I don't see everybody, but at least see them uh, listed. And so, yeah, um, you have um, these slides also available with me kind of stuttering over them. And so if you want to go a bit deeper in there, um, please do so. So I'm going to just quickly kind of give a very, very short kind of um, fly through. Sony, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a name that you may have heard of with really excellent headphones. I really like these ones. And I'm, I'm pushing forward the name here a bit because um, having been a startup CEO, I, I know that research and development often kind of forgets where, where the money is coming from. And, and we're very thankful um, for kind of having such a great uh, mother company. And with that, I thought um, actually I'd also like it to give out some more shout outs at that point. First off to my team, um, they were the ones that actually made all of this possible. And um, then secondly, um, the people that got us here, um, the investors that believed in, uh, in Cygnus. And then before that, um, all of the, the people um, at INI, um, I think uh, many of us wouldn't be in the field without INI. And more, more importantly, um, big shout out to, to Toby. I think uh, the majority of us in here would not work on this topic without Toby. Um, so I think um, this is a great opportunity to say um, thank you. Um, and then, um, to the sponsors, I, th I think we should all be aware that uh, public taxpayers 
are, are paying for a lot of this. And so I think um, Switzerland is really great taxpayers. Um, so please come to Switzerland uh, or at least bring your money here um, to the bank accounts that we have. We also have great bank accounts here. Um, and so then uh, last but not least, thank you very much um, to all of the organizers. So to Guillermo, Davide, um, Costas, uh, Cornelia, and then um, Davide and Prophecy for sponsoring. So I quickly wanted to use this um, the, rather than kind of reiterating what is already said in this super strange recording. I really do not like the online format. Um, so I like to have the audience around to see whether people actually like uh, what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, you can you can look a bit more into more details there. So yeah, Sony, we're doing semiconductor. We, we do this very successfully, um, largest player in the market and with some of the most exciting technology. Now, I think this is one of the nicest privileges of um, being acquired by such a great company is kind of suddenly seen behind the scenes and it's just mind blowing. So um, it's really, really, really cool to see what is all in the pipeline and, and what's all happening here. So um, it's a really nice privilege. And with that, I mean, that doesn't come from, from nowhere. And so there's a whole range of research entities um, across the world. And so we're one of them. Um, Sony AVS is one of them. And, and as mentioned before, um, A, we're, we're here in Zurich or in Schlieren and more specifically. And um, we, we used to um, be called Insightness. Um, we've been working on event-based vision sensors for very long. I would say like me personally for about a decade. And um, we've been doing all sorts of um, interesting things. You may have seen our YouTube videos where we sent one of our co-founders to drive in front of a drone um, or where we did like some, some inside out tracking. Um, so we've been working a lot on, uh, with this technology. And so I thought instead of just kind of giving only an overview of kind of some of the most recent results that I'm allowed to show, um, I thought I'd also like to share some, some of our insights, um, some of the insight I personally had across uh, along the way. And I think, well, I, I tried to put them into formulas such that you can digest them also after the, the talk. Um, so this is the, the first formula here. Um, I think in similar forms, uh, I've been around at many different times, but for me, it's an important one because it clearly distinguishes what we call event magnitude from uh, the threshold. So the threshold is what triggers the event. The event magnitude is the amount of temporal contrast that you actually capture with an event. And I think this distinction is often not really properly made. And I think it should be done. It helped us a lot to kind of start figuring out, okay, what is actually a signal and what is noise? And, and the signal is an integral of temporal contrast. Now, what is very important here, um, again, I mean, the motivation behind looking into all of this is because we, we tried to kind of build better sensors. And so we had to figure out what is important for the software people. And so we had to figure out how to properly kind of capture what they need. And so um, one dimension that we, that, we, that we figured out with makes it a bit nasty to define all of this is that um, constant signal in most sensors is like a constant input. And for an event-based vision sensor, not so trivial, at least to me, um, a, a constant input is a constant rate. Um, it, it's a constant increase in light intensity. So if you want to characterize SNR, good luck, um, because you look at a moving signal when you just roll it out in time. And so that, that made it very tricky. So we did some more digging. I think we have now some new, new nice kind of tricks on, on how we can do this. And I think that was the second insight. So first distinguishing between event magnitude and, and the threshold, and then secondly, figuring out that, um, that it's, it's the, the SNR has to capture two dimensions. It's, it's, it's not just the, the intensity and how accurate we can kind of represent the, um, the magnitude um, versus, the, versus the threshold, but also how accurately we can actually um, uh, capture the time. And then I think the last one is that usually we express the thresholds in terms of percentage, and that makes it a bit nasty um, because you then have an increase um, that is not um, the same amount in, in absolute percent. And so if you just use it as a factor, it's also interesting from a mathematical point of view. You can formulate things a bit easier. Um, that at least were some, some things that helped me a lot in, in the past. And I think that was um, the, the formula that, that helps us a lot to think about the future. Um, when we think of, okay, what makes up the event magnitude? So if we drop all of, this, all of the noise and, and assume a perfect sensor, um, then an in, in individual event, what does it capture? And it, it's unfortunately, it's a huge mix of things. And um, once you start kind of looking a bit into what this mix is made up of, um, you can see that, uh, for instance, here, this is the optical flow equation. Nicely, it's in terms of reflectance. So I, I, I think that I did like once this, this derivation, it's very nice to see that you're kind of illumination independent. 
um, directly in the, in the math there. But but what, what you can also see is um, you can see what are the problems that when you have a bag of events and you want to make an inference, you, you have kind of this under constraint um, problem. And so what you need to do is you, you somehow have to kind of properly correlate either long time, or long X, or long Y. Um, and, and the other thing that we figured is no, nobody so far, at least that I've seen, is, is working on using events for reflectance change inference. Now, you see a lot of inference around if you correlate like events long time then, and you know what the external signal is, you can do uh, active illumination, so you can do structured lighting, these funky things. Um, and then if you do kind of correlation within space time along X, Y, and T, um, then you can kind of do this like contrast maximizations and the like. Um, and so I, th I think that that's kind of then helped us also to think about, okay, but what can we actually use it for and where, where it may actually be suitable. And I think one dimension that is also um, very exciting here is like, uh, if you just use the, the event magnitude, it's a very nice entropy queue and it helps you to kind of guide processing. Um, now, one reason I kind of would like to emphasize this is because what we have learned in the past is that the front end of an event-based vision sensor tends to be noisier than the front end of um, other sensing technologies. And so therefore, at times, it may be just helpful to use the events kind of as a guide rather than as the, as the main information source. And I think like just a previous talk kind of nicely um, highlighted this, that it's, it's, a, it's an important trade-off to make kind of, um, so yeah, um, then some examples. So yeah, again, if you, if you know what your what your how how your pattern looks in time, then you can nicely correlate your event stream against it. This gives you kind of really nice videos. Um, as here, um, you can do this also very fast. Um, also nicely shown in, in the previous talk. So um, I think that's a very very nice property. Um, then the very well known tracking. So again here. Um, what we what we've been working a lot is um, making these sort of things more robust. Um, it, it's not necessarily trivial. It's not what gets you to nice papers, but um, what is a very important task. And again, once you start doing these sort of things, you start to realize how important noise is and how important it is to kind of properly characterize it and then uh, design your senses accordingly. And then the last uh, item, okay, here you, you can also see what the advantages are if, if you do this tracking. Um, so yeah, uh, even in, in the presence of motion blur, you can continuously track or in the presence of kind of repetitive patterns that are self-similar, um, you, you don't have these kind of um, tracking issues that you, that you have with, let's say, OpenCV um, with this kind of audit. Then, um, I said the last one, I think that's, that's also a topic mentioned in multiple um, discussions. I mean, we're not reinventing the wheel here. Um, is, is, is kind of just uh, infusing different sensing modalities. Again, I mean, events have really nice properties. They have some strong shortcomings. And so if you can kind of combine um, uh, the nice advantages of one sensing modality, such as a depth sensor, with the nice low latency and the low uh, power consumption of the EVS, that's, that's very um, useful. So yeah, that, this has been kind of a quick overlook of some of our activities um, internally. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're always very happy to have um, more talent on board. Um, we, we're soon going to um, kind of have some more positions open. Um, so please follow us on LinkedIn. Then uh, also check out some other um, exciting Sony jobs. Again, um, Sony is a pretty exciting company. Uh, it's, it tends to be kind of, a, um, yeah, forgot to make um, uh, when, when you look at the really big American or Chinese companies. But um, it has been around for some time and it has aggregated some, some really, really exciting technologies and potential. And so, um, yeah, please also reach out to me if you're interested in a job um, in a really cool company. Thank you very much. Uh, I tried to keep it short. Um, we already lost about 10% of the audience in this session already. Now we're down to 50 people, so we, we even lost more. So, uh, yeah, I tried to keep it short. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. Uh uh, I love the formula that you showed, and uh, we start with this with a question from uh, Kobina. Uh, and uh, uh, Kobina says it's the right way to look at it. Uh, and all these variables, though, are confounded, and to unconfound them, you need the grand rules, like the, the, the gradient of R. Yeah, I'm just saying this is what's really going on, and this is how you should communicate it. To your to your team what the sensor is doing so, so i i think for us it was very helpful to kind of realize that you, you, a single event doesn't give you anything and actually two events even don't give you anything and then only once you have a bunch of events you can start aggregating them into some sort of inference so as soon as you throw in some additional constraints as 
I know what is like the external signal you want to correlate it to, um, then you start getting to some interesting points. Now, the real challenge, and again, this is why I talked a lot about noise, the real challenge then comes to the question, how many events do you need to aggregate until you get a reliable inference? And that's very much a question of noise. And, and as you start digging deeper there, you start realizing, again, this noise is more than just like how well your sensor captures a step. It's, it's very much a function of how well it can encode a, a slope. <laughs> and it's, 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 it was a bit tricky to think about this, and at least for me to wrap my head around it, but uh, and, and the slope it, it helped us a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and Christian, the, the slope changes the latency of the analog part. So, so that's also true. Yes, yes, so yes. You need, you need you know, yeah, so, so yeah. <laughs> but, but I'm just saying, unless you write these things down this way, the application guys and the software guys, they totally don't understand. This is a language that they can understand. So that's what you, you need to do. Yeah, and, so, and, and even, even more so, you have to come up with metrics that the software guys know, hey, look, this is a sensor that actually works for my application. And that sensor may not be so suited um, because at the end of the day, I mean, Sony Semiconductor, we, we want to sell semiconductors to, to the people that, that develop algorithms and to develop software. So yeah, that's, that's where a lot of the thinking comes from. All right, uh, there is one. Uh, okay, there is one question for Oliver about the uh, extreme examples for lighting conditions uh, in the 3D reconstruction. Uh, and in terms of uh, extreme uh, range, uh, which was answered in the, in the chat box, I would like to uh, ask Oliver in the, in the projection of the laser, which exactly property from the event-based sensors is used. Do you, do you use the exact uh, timestamps of the sensor, for example? Uh, are you synchronizing somehow the laser projection with them? It, it, it was basically, um, so there's a temporal calibration between the, the starting phase of the projector, which is peri periodically scanning. And there's a sync signal basically coming from the projector. So we actually used a, a Pico projector, uh, actually we did had multiple systems. So one was a Galvo based laser scanner, which was the outdoor system, which used a, uh, uh, you know, a, a homebrew laser scanning system with an infrared laser. Um, uh, and, and another one was using just a Pico projector uh, with a, you know, uh, uh, a MEMS based scanning mirror. And in both cases, we had a sync signal uh, for the projectors that we we're using to, uh, you perform temporal calibration with the events coming out. And that's really about it. Just look, so basically based on the um, known uh, scanning position uh, as a function of time relative to the sync signal of the laser scanner and what the events were, uh, time stamps were coming out of the uh, event sensor, the difference between those basically told us what the disparity was. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's as far as we did. So we didn't do, there wasn't any smart denoising. And, and in fact, all the stuff that Christian's talking about, about understanding the noise in the event sensor and how it actually um, affects the, your ability to be able to do inference was not some, I would say we only scratched the surface of that. And there's still, I'm sure you guys have, have looked at some, some um, smarter ways to process the, the data that you get from a 3D sensor like that. Other questions, feel free just to unmute yourself and ask. I have a question, Christian. Uh... Do you use the, the features that you said that you're tracking? And we've seen lots of corner tracking today in the workshop. Um, it's good to have them and to be able to, you know, detect them and track them. But are we using these corners or these features to do visual odometry? So I, I can't go too deep in depth on, on what we actually kind of do, do with this. Now, what I, the part that I can talk about um, is that we, we use this often kind of to assess also um, the, the, the quality and because it's, it's a thing that where we can get easily kind of granted. Um, it's something when, when you just track something, it's very nice because you can, you can run a lot of experiments because you exactly know, okay, what are, what are you actually looking for? Much more than when, when you don't know the underlying, um, let's say um, DX, DT and DY, DT, which, which, which you know very nicely in a lot of these cases. Um, 
when it comes to, um, let's say, slamma, visual inertial odometry, I, I think at least, um, I would say, <laughs> from, from what I see kind of out there, it, it appears as if um, the IMU starts to become the dominant sensor, and then you take vision from time to time to kind of correct for it, at least in some of the, of the, of the let's say, commercial solutions out there. So still not fully clear to me whether, whether EVS have a, have a strong differentiating edge for just the VIO or slant part. Um, there are definitely corner cases that you can probably only do with EVS, but, but uh, the commercial impact of these ones is, is hard to assess. I, I can add something about this uh, probably because uh, at, at the end of the at the end we are collaborating also with Sony, so uh, we have uh, we are uh, we have some experiment also with feature tracking. Uh, the problem of the feature is that uh, Chiara said before in the in the in the talk when you increase the resolution uh, everything slows down because you are doing a process seven by event and this is uh, affecting also the the performances. Often uh, all the literature is based on the data set provided by Zurich. It is done on a QVGA resolution, so it's a uh, very challenging already go to VGA in megapixel. So we have served in prophecy that you can start feature. There are features that you can use for uh, to optimize the localization. And with Sony now, currently there are some development for this also. So I, I have a question for David and uh, Luca, and uh, thank you very much for showing all these applications. It's really very motivating how to talk to the other to other people outside the field. Um, if you do, you find that uh, the HDR I have seen for the, the cabin application is uh, mainly HDR, right? It is not uh, really a speed or. Uh, do you see the applications involving just the HDR aspect of uh, the events uh, being actually yep. pretty like critical? I don't know, Luca, what you want to ask or I go? Yeah, I go for it. So, okay, in HDR, there are, okay, there are a lot of nice work. There was a presentation done by, uh, also by Robert at the beginning, but also the activity work, the work done by the group of Zurich, uh, the group of Scaramuzza, so uh, Daniel. They are doing fusion with frames and they're trying to recover the high dynamic range from uh, the events. So they are correcting the frame images, uh, collecting information with events, fusing together to find the details that usually are, not, are lost in the image. And, and this is very interesting. And we are having also, we have a both situation, only events and fusion with frames. Of course, it depends a lot by the use case. Uh, another example is the, um, the arc welding. Before in the presentation, uh, Luca was presenting this pattern monitoring. Usually with the arc welding, you have the problem to find the point of soldering and track this point of soldering and do the cl close the loop to control. And this is a, a, an application that currently is a product. It's not anymore a research project. It's a product that will go on in, the, in production very soon uh, in partnership with a big company. And uh, this is a full HDR. In automotive, uh, automotive we, we have a lot of experience. Uh, we have a lot of uh, example of uh, HDR in the data set of DSEC of David. Uh, there is a lot of example of uh, HDR, uh, especially in change of illumination, tunnel and so on. And this is another classical situation when the HDR is very important. And of course, the, the driven monitoring system. Uh, currently they are using infrared light for the commercial application, but in this collaboration with Xperi, Xperi did the full development of the algorithm. We just supported from the point of view the software and they are, uh, they are ready for uh, with the product. Now they are uh, proposing this solution as a product between their portfolio. So this is quite amazing and uh, it's very promising. And I can say that the HD camera improved a lot to this, especially the, the quality of the HDR. Mm -hmm. Other questions? There is a lot of praise about uh, uh, Christian's formula and uh, definitely <laughs> this is what I'm going to go and uh, uh, present to my students tomorrow <laughs> and discuss it. Um, uh, Guillermo, do you want to take back over? Sure. 
I think if we are, if there are no more questions, we could uh, start wrapping up. Mm -hmm. So I, I would ask you to turn on the cameras and take a screenshot, if you don't mind. I mean, thank you very much to everyone who is here till the end. There are about 50 participants or so. Thank yeah, you, so Shun. We had also a lot of people like Shoshun in, in China. <laughs> yes, so I was, so I was uh, gonna say, may I thanks. make a little advertisement? Uh, sure. In a week from now, so starting June 28, the Telluride workshop will start one week every day, about two hours. Registration is for free. Please enjoy. You'll hear more about spiking computing and event based processing and others. Yeah. Um... And if you are not able to attend any of the talks today, the speakers made a fantastic job pre-recording the videos and they are available online. There is a YouTube playlist and the slides are also available. So thank you very much. Thanks very much to everyone who contributed to the workshop with the papers, the reviewers, uh, the co-organizers, uh, the speakers and the sponsor. Let me take a screenshot. Okay, another one, because this one only half of it work. Uh, it seems to be working, yeah. Okay, well, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Have a good day. We need bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye, bye. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye. Oh, nice seeing you. Thanks, everyone.